Hey everyone, I'm Chris. I serve as the lead pastor of Mill Creek Foursquare and welcome to our podcast. This exists as an extension of the teaching ministry of our pastoral team. Here you're going to be able to find everything from Sunday messages to midweek communications, classes, interviews, conversations with friends. So we hope that you feel invited to participate in the life of our fellowship and receive of this ministry. Here you're gonna be able to learn more about current events and much about the scriptures. So enjoy, relax, breathe, and ultimately may you be experiencing the presence of God. Our goal is to make disciples of Jesus who are experiencing his life, engaging in his presence, extending the gospel, to their family, neighborhood, workplace, and world. So welcome and enjoy. Welcome everyone. This is Pastor Trevor with uh, Dr. John Bentall. And we are here with our normal midweek experience, our midweek podcast, where we regularly are expounding upon, are diving deeper into, and exploring the topics that we've been talking about on Sundays, which for the last few months has been the book of Revelation. Now, at the point of this coming out, we're a few weeks out of Revelation. We're probably just beginning a new series that we are going to be launching into. And so, uh, but we do want to land the plane. I mean, we're on the precipice of the end in the sense of like our study of Revelation and our ability to put together all of the books that we've been reading over the last few months. And so we do want to do one final episode, a Q&A episode. We did, this would be our second Q&A episode we did one last week as well of answering your questions. You know, we provided a space on our website as well as if you just ask us to be able to or email us to be able to ask questions that you actively have about things we're talking about on Sundays. And we want to be able to have this be a place and space where we can really pastor our community and pastor through questions and ideas that people have been asking. And so we want to dive back into that. We have a few more questions. Luckily, none of the questions this week are about my sermons, which is good. So <laughs> Dr. J can be on the hot spot a little more than I was last week. But uh, our first question, we'll just dive right in. The first question that we were posed and been asked about is, uh, it's a question that I think we've been asked by a few people, and it's a very specific question about a very specific image and number within the book. In the center of the book, in Revelation chapter 7, we're told of the 144,000, and we're told of the tribes of Israel, we're told about how these break down by these 12 tribes of 12,000 per tribe, and the question we've been asked is what to make of this, right? Is this a literal number? Are we supposed to be counting and waiting for a literal 144,000 people? Or is this meant to be read? Is there a broader theological point at work here? And so, uh, John, what do you make of this? 144,000, Revelation chapter 7. Yeah, it's, it's a good question, and it's an understandable question, I think, because... This is one of those numbers, one of those, as we will, as we will discuss, we, we would say this is one of those symbols in the book as opposed to just a literal sort of number. But this is one of those points in the book that people often sort of gravitate toward. Even someone who maybe has never read the book of Revelation carefully for themselves and might just sort of know a few things from it, either from certain kinds of novels or films or just a general cultural awareness or a general awareness from being part of the church. You know, there are certain images and ideas and phrases and numbers in, in the book that people are just sort of familiar with. There's this Mark of the Beast thing, and that somehow <laughs> is important. There's the number associated with it, 666, and we've talked about that on the podcast. There are... Uh, ideas like rapture and antichrist and, and some of these these things that we've discussed before. <clears throat> and 144,000 fits within that. A lot of people, even if they don't have, you know, a, a sense of exactly what the book of Revelation is all about, they might have some vague sense, oh, isn't there a number like 144,000 that somehow has, has significance? Well, I think I told you my tattoo artist, we were talking about this before the episode, My, I got another tattoo a few, about a month ago or end of December, 
And she specifically brought up the end of the world, which was great timing because I was like, and she's not a follower of Jesus. And so I was able to talk about the end. You know, she was like talking about the end times. I was like, oh, I've actually been thinking about this a lot. But she specifically, because she grew up Jehovah Witness, I believe is, was that she specifically brought up 144,000. She's like, who are the 144,000? And so I was like, man, and then now we have other people in our community ask us this specific question. And so, yes, I think it's, you're right. Definitely. It's a question that people in and outside the camp ask a question about. Yeah. And I think uh, probably one of the very first things to say that's, that's important is just that like like pretty much every other number in the book of Revelation, there is important symbolic significance that we want to pay attention to. The author does not simply throw around numbers just because, and the author does not... Uh, for the most part, doesn't seem to intend that every sort of number that's being used should be understood in a sort of precise, literal kind of fashion. Rather, as we have seen, numbers tend to function in symbolic and in symbolic ways and in ways that have a kind of theological resonance. So the number seven is frequently used uh, in ways that at times might have a certain kind of literal significance, like we've got seven churches being written to, and it and there's no reason to question whether that has a certain literal significance to it. But it clearly also has symbolic and theological significance as the number seven is used throughout Scripture and throughout the book of Revelation to um, to signify something being complete or made whole or, 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 ha- or sort of coming to its sort of telos or purpose yeah. or end or something like that. And so as we've talked about, the, the, the idea of seven churches being written, written to can be understood in both sort of literal and symbolic terms in the sense of uh, seven actual individual churches, but also in a sense this message being for those those seven and for the church as a whole. Um, the likewise, the number twelve <clears throat> throughout the book can be understood as having sort of literal historical theological significance with reference to the twelve tribes of Israel and to the twelve apostles uh, in the context of the New Testament, um, but also deep. Th- theological and symbolic significance in terms of being used in ways that are evocative of what it means to be the people of God. So that we, we don't want to just sort of limit our understanding of these numbers to, okay, any, anytime I see 12 or a multiple of 12, I need to look out for some specific manifestation of that number in the world or in history or whatever it might be. But rather, we want to ask what kinds of uh, theological claims is the author potentially trying to make through the use of these these sort of symbolic things? So, uh, so uh, yeah. Ge- the the general point to make is just that that we need to sort of recognize the symbolic significance of numbers. I mean, even uh, one other example, just to sort of. Um, uh, solidify this interpretive framework. We talked a lot uh, in one of the episodes about the the numbers associated with the length of time that the people of God will have to sort of suffer or undergo mm, trial yeah. or tribulation. Yeah, the Three 260 and a half days. Years. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. And again, the the point is this sort of limited time frame, which harkens back to certain time frames in the Old Testament. It also is sort of three and a half being half of seven has sort of this symbolic significance that it's not a complete time frame, but but rather a limited one. And so all of this should help us to know, to, to, to at least approach this, this number being used in, in Revelation chapter 7 in a way that probably isn't intended to sort of, okay, well, there's some numerical significance to 144,000 that we need to sort of watch out for. Or like this idea, I think, I actually, I'm not an expert on Jehovah's Witnesses or, or anything, but I think you brought up your tattoo artist, and I think my, my sense is that in some uh, uh, religious frameworks like Jehovah's Witness, uh, the, the there would be some sense that it would be a literal amount. Yeah, that's what she was saying too. She would asked be, me who were specifically that's the, the group, amount of yeah. people that would somehow be saved in the mm-hmm. end or something like that. They also meant birthdays, so I found oh, out. Well, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> um, but but I think the the crucial thing to recognize is that it, this seems to be a symbolic way of portraying the people of God, and in a way that calls to mind the covenant people of God in the Old Testament, the uh, the the twelve tribes.
tribes of Israel and the covenant people of God in the context of, uh, of this sort of new covenant, uh, which has to do with 12 disciples, 12 apostles. We see this language come up again later on in the book in, uh, in, uh, in chapter 21 as well. <clears throat> well, what we, th- what we see in chapter 7 that's really important, I think, to pay attention to in terms of why, what's going on with this number and with its symbolic significance is that it's one of the various places in the book where uh, there's a contrast or a kind of juxtaposition between what John hears and what John sees. I talked about this briefly in in the sermon I preached on chapter 21, and we've talked about it in our discussions of of chapter 5, where Jesus is portrayed, or or, or where John hears language about Jesus being the, the conquering lion of the tribe of Judah, but then turns and sees this slaughtered lamb. Uh, this is one of those moments where, if you if you notice, what John hears is the number of those who have been sealed, uh, or who were sealed, 144,000, sealed out of every tribe of the people of Israel. And then the tribes are listed in a way that calls to mind uh, texts from uh, the book of Numbers in the Old Testament. And it's really evocative of this idea of preparing for battle. So much of what's going on in a book like Numbers is the counting off of and the listing of of tribes. but specifically, right? Yeah, yeah, but specifically oriented toward those who are sort of of fighting age and can be sort of mustered for, for battle. And so it's evocative not only of the people of God, but also of the people of God being sort of prepared prepared for battle. Um, but then what we notice is in, in chapter 7, verse 9, after this, I looked. So he has heard something about this very specific number and this specific listing of 12 tribes evoking the covenant people of God, uh, Israel. But then he looks and sees a great multitude that can't be counted. So right away, there's tension there in the juxtaposition. We've got a very precise number evocative of the people of God, but then this great multitude that no one can count. Mm. Clearly the author's trying to sort of communicate something that isn't just, uh, you know, the importance of some literal number. And this great multitude that can't be counted is, is comprised of people from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages standing before the throne. Uh, and so We've got this sort of tension that's created, and the, the images are intended, just like in the, the heavenly throne room in chapter 5, the images are intended to sort of, by, by being juxtaposed, they're sort of mutually interpreting, or we need to sort of understand them to, or, or one way to put it is that the initial image, what John hears, kind of sets up certain expectations, and then what he sees reframes or recontextualizes or provides the sort of uh, the the kind of interpretive lens that the author wants us to use to understand this reality. And so, what I, I, I think the most helpful way to understand it is that John is using this language and this imagery as a way of picturing the people of God in a way that calls to mind their the, the Jewish heritage of the people of God, but also envisioned this eschatological community of uh, Jew and Gentile and all people from all sort of walks of life and all nations and tribes and languages and tongues being brought into this covenant community. Is there a critique here too? Then I so you're saying that there was the 144,000. The there'd be like a militaristic census type tie-in. Would you say there's also a critique here then of kind of like the way because we're told of the 144,000 of that as like militaristic tones, and then we're told of the the people from every tribe, every town, mm-hmm. every nation, but they're followers of the lamb. They're clothed in white. Is that meant to be a almost a contrast, like the lion and lamb kind of imagery as well? Yeah, yeah. I think in a way. <clears throat> Yeah, and I don't know if I would. I don't know if critique is necessarily the the language I would I would use, but certainly there's a sort of juxtaposition here, where uh, like we talked about in the last episode, uh, in the last Q and A episode, um, there are multiple places in the book where where the reader or hearer is sort of poised for some kind of battle scene, but then it doesn't take place. And I think this is one of those. Oh, yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. uh, It's it's portrayed in this way that you're sort of led to expect, okay, they're counting off tribes much like they would in in a book like Numbers, preparing for some kind of battle. But then what do they end up doing? They end up being sort of joining around the throne and worshiping instead. And so... what we what we end up seeing is uh, is a picture of worship rather than a, a picture of battle, and we see this language associated with um, 
uh, with them being followers of the Lamb and, and being washed with robes uh, that are made white in the blood of the Lamb. And so, yeah, it, there's a sense in which this fits very well with the, the kind of, um, I guess, the reinterpretation that the slaughtered lamb image gives to the notion of Jesus being a sort of conquering lion. In the same way that what it means for Jesus to conquer is not just to sort of swoop in and wipe everybody out in a straightforwardly sort of violent kind of uh, overpowering sort of way, but rather through humble self-sacrifice and the giving of his life uh, for the sake of humanity. In the same way, what it means for the people of God to be the people of God, what it means to follow the Lamb is to participate participate in that conquering through worship and witness as opposed to mustering for battle. Uh, and so the, uh, the, um, the, the one other thing that I think is important to, to note about the portrayal of the people of God here is this is just one one way that the author sort of portrays the people of God. There are a number of different symbols that the author is going to use throughout this middle section of the book. So in our last Q&A episode, we talked a little bit about the the various cycles of seven and how we're we're sort of being invited into a series of um, portrayals of what it looks like when God's judgment is sort of poured out on the earth in order to set all things right, to judge what is evil, and and uh, and to um, and to bring about God's redemptive purposes. <clears throat> uh, the the image that we see here is of the people of God sealed in a way that, that has to do with the notion of identity and protection. These are people that are sealed or marked or protected by God. So it's a lot like you know, uh, various other portrayals of God's judgment and salvation throughout the Bible. What happens in the flood narrative? God's judgment is poured out, but uh, a remnant or the people of God, Noah and his family, are sort of sealed, protected, marked, uh, for God and and come through. What happens in the Exodus story? God's judgment is poured out in order to judge those who are opposed to Him and to bring about redemption for for His people. And those whose houses are marked with the blood of the lambs are are spared as the judgment is sort of poured out. That's the kind of thing that we see throughout this middle section of the Book of Revelation. That various images of judgment being poured out. Uh, take place. But then we see the, the church uh, symbolized by these th- this symbolic number of 144,000, or the temple in chapter 11, or again the two witnesses in chapter 11. These are various angles, various ways that the author is sort of picturing what it looks like for the people of God to be protected in the midst of judgment being poured out, and ultimately to be vindicated as the faithful, as as, as the people of God. There's almost a, a level of, because I, I know it's what we're saying is it's not a literal 144,000 people, mm-hmm. but I wonder, it almost gives a sense of certainty, and not in the sense of there's literally 144,000 who are going to be you know saved or something, or, but it almost gives a sense of, in the midst of like chaos, it gives a midst of like so, certainty and coherence mm-hmm. that is a, I, I don't, I'm not saying this is the theological point, but I... I just could see the application of what you're saying much so in the sense of like sealing, there's a sense of certainty that we kind of know that, uh, I don't know. I mean, obviously we know it calls us to, we know the people that he's writing to are struggling with compromise. They're struggling with participation within culture and other things and such. But yet at the same time, it at least edifies me in the sense of knowing not that there's a specific 140 set of people, but there's a theological point that God seals. He sees you. He's with you. He sets you apart. He's in it, how he has throughout history in the midst of times that seem turbulent and troublesome. And uh, yeah, anyway, so that's, no, that's, that's great. Yeah. Anything else you want to add before we jump into our next question? No, no, we can move on. Yeah. So the next question is about, is really about scripture itself is about the process that revelation came to be. We've talked a little bit about this. We talked, I know in past episodes, we've kind of referred to it at different points, but 
I mean, we've been talking about how John is just this brilliant mind, this who knows, you know, refers, has more allusions to the Hebrew Bible than there are probably verses in the text. He intertwines like the symphony of voices with the prophets, especially. And so, yet at the same time, we know in some sense this is a vision, like he's, ref- he's getting a vision. And so the question we've been asked is just what is the interplay here? Like, how does it make sense that he's having a vision, yet at the same time, he's this theological mastermind who's weaving together all these things. Like, how do those ideas, and how does the writing and the authorship, how does it all combine? Yeah. How do they, how do those work together, yeah. I guess? Yeah, it's a great question. And it's, I mean, again, probably one of the first things that needs to be said is is it's certain kinds of questions are thoughtful and great questions, but ones that we probably would never, will never have like, a, a completely certain answer for, yeah. right? Like we don't have John sort of taking a selfie on Patmos while he's sort of <laughs> having this vision and, and, and writing this book, you know? And so we don't, we'll never know for sure sort of how did this book come into existence? What exactly was the, the process like? But people have asked some really thoughtful questions about sort of like, I mean, you read through a, a book like this or you sit uh, and 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 uh, you know you're part of a church and you listen to 14 or so sermons on <laughs> on a yeah. complex book like this and you start to wonder, is he having these visions all in like one sort of moment or all in one sort of sequence? And then like, is this like a marathon of visions or is this like like a a kind of you know, things that took place over sort of a longish period of time. It'd be a long vision. It totally. took us 17 totally. weeks and we didn't even preach yeah. every verse. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And so I think th- these are good questions. We probably can't answer them sort of decisively or, or completely conclusively, but I think we can provide some reflections that are helpful. Um, because I think I would suggest that the two, two of the least helpful approaches to thinking about how a book like this came into existence, one, one of the least helpful would be something like, um, well, John was just really creative and had some really interesting ideas and wanted to portray these crazy sort of visions. So he made up a lot of interesting stuff. And, you know, he was just a, you know. So one unhelpful approach, especially from a Christian perspective, would be to suggest that it's just the work of a human person who had a really overly sort of creative mind. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Another, an equal, I would say sort of an equally unhelpful, maybe not equally, but another really unhelpful approach from my perspective would be to think that that John's mind and creativity and theological understanding had nothing to do with it at all. That it was just, you know, he, it's like his mind went blank and his body was just taken yeah, over. Eyes by, rolled back in his yeah, head. Yeah, exactly. He, mouth started foaming. Yeah, yeah, had a vision he couldn't understand. Woke up with these tablets with weird visions. Yeah, yeah, or, yeah. Or just dictated exactly what he was supposed yeah. to write and didn't understand any of it. I think thinking of those two extremes as especially unhelpful. I would suggest that the, some of the most helpful ways we might envisage what's happening here in a book like this being composed is that John legitimately had some kind of charismatic vision and he's trying to relate it to people. Uh, and yet in as he's doing that, he is, one, he's not just trying to state the bare facts like, well, this happened and this happened and this happened and I just got to get it all down before I forget any of it. Clearly, he is crafting the narrative that, that that he sets the vision in in a very deliberate, very creative way, and in a way that demonstrates, you know, thoughtful theological engagement with his own scriptures, the the Hebrew Bible, right, the the scriptures of Israel. Um, and so I think we need to, one, do justice to the fact that John is very much an author and a theologian in his own right, and is not just, man, I had a crazy vision, I got to tell everybody about it. And then two, uh, I think it's important that we, that, and this is something that should expand to our entire view of Scripture, that we do justice to the fact that the way God seems to like to do things is, <laughs> even if he, in theory, could just do it himself, he seems to, God seems to like to work with and in and through people in ways that don't just completely overpower 
human freedom and human agency, but instead work with and sanctify, sort of make holy and use for his purposes, human agency, human creativity, human um, uh, abilities, that kind of thing. So I would suggest the, 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 the most helpful way to sort of do justice to those realities as we think about how a book like this might have been composed is to constantly sort of ask ourselves questions about not only, um, you know, what was the content of the vision, but also how is John seeking to portray this vision? How is he using his own sort of theological understanding to communicate something that would ultimately be what God wants to, to reveal in and through his authorial agency? That's, you know, and that's, I feel like in many ways that view you just articulate, articulated, has like an applicative value to us as a people in the sense that this never came to my mind before, but just the idea of just God working through human agency, God deciding to work with humans and through humans in their own styles, their own cultures, their own uh, personalities and giftings and such. It, it almost speaks to us in a way for how God uses each of us as well, that there's a sense that God, now obviously we're not writing, we're not talking about us writing scripture, that was the original question, but the idea of how God works with each of us in our personalities and our styles and our own ways, and he uses that, like he sanctifies it, like you said beautifully, and he sanctifies that, he refines it, and he uses it in his own way to communicate to the world. And so I almost, I feel like that in many ways, has application broader in some ways to how God uses humanity in general and his desire to work through humans versus the idea of him just overpowering humans or uh, totally annihilating humans and then they just kind of robotically do what he said or something. Yeah. Yeah. And I think there's, there's beauty in that, both in how the scriptures seem to have come into being and in how we see God working in, in many of our individual lives, right? There's at times we might question why God would work through limited humans and messy, sort of complicated human situations, and yet that seems to be precisely who this God is and what this God is like, that even if he, he could sort of theoretically just snap his fingers and do stuff, whether it's have a book be written or, uh, or accomplish something in the world or whatever, he over and over in the narrative and over and over in, in what we know about how these scriptures came into existence, God seems to almost not only allow for, but like revel in the idea of sort of working with and in and through humans in all of their messiness and, and limitation, always drawing people toward himself and then using people in order to reach mm. other people. No, that's good. Yeah. So now we were asked a second question, unless there's something else you want to say about that. Do you want to say anything else about this view of inspiration? Uh, no, not necessarily. Maybe the one, the one other thing that I, I think I mentioned in conversation with someone who asked a question along these lines is it can be helpful. Uh, again, I don't think we can know exactly what happened. I think it's entirely possible that John had this entire vision in sort of one moment or one sort of time frame, and then and this is what is sort of recorded. But I think there's, I, I would be open to the possibility that he had multiple visionary encounters over a somewhat lengthy period of time. I know that there certainly is precedent within uh, the Old Testament for you know a lot of the prophetic books. We might assume that they're just sort of a prophet writing down his kind of greatest hits or something like that, like, oh, I got to write down all of this stuff. But in many ways, what the prophetic books often seem to be, especially longer ones like Isaiah mm -hmm. or Jeremiah, is less like sort of one narrative or one sort of sustained prophetic argument or something like that, and more like a kind of anthology that, that captures like the crucial aspects of this, the prophetic ministry of this one figure. Um, and so it's entirely possible, I think, that, that the, the book of Revelation might have come about in a similar kind of way, that, that it would have these sort of... Um, <clears throat> Uh, that, that it potentially sort of happened over a long period of time, that, that John was sort of engaged in this uh, visionary experience and then this sort of prophetic and theological activity of composing the document itself. You know, and I think in many ways that that actually gives us a deeper sense and affirmation of biblical inspiration because the way I think of verses just someone having a random vision and then writing it all down or something, yeah. 
is there is this picture of just this deep reflection and this deep over cultures and over decades of people reflecting on the scriptures and the church, the early church reflecting on what does this mean for us? Is this a canon? Like how does this affirm, apply to us as the people of God that actually this longer process in many ways, and even a poc- uh, process that included much theological reflection with brilliant minds. I mean, some of the most brilliant minds we probably the world's ever seen actually gives me an appreciation for the scriptures that we have and the tradition that we enter into. Like there's this picture of a, a 18th, 19th century. I, I always show it when I talk about biblical inspiration and just how the authors were inspired. It's a picture of an 18th, 19th century Jewish rabbi, theologian, um, Solomon Schnechter, I believe, yeah, Schnechter. And he, he had uncovered in Cairo about 100,000, I believe it's 100... 100,000, yeah, 100,000 manuscripts, Hebrew manuscripts found in Cairo. And there's this picture of him. It's like his office, right? Mm-hmm. And he's just hunched over. I mean, he's got a beard, he's hunched over, and he's studying this scroll, and he's like kind of writing. And he's got all these other scrolls like all over his desk, and it's just as messy, but you can tell he's deep in theological reflection. Yeah. And that's the picture I most often show when I'm teaching on biblical inspiration, mm-hmm. just this picture of these authors who are in conversation with, I mean, I just imagine John, you know, he's got the Isaiah scroll, he's got the different scrolls, like he's in conversation with these other authors in deep reflection. And it actually gives a v- even more value, like making sense of these visions he's received and, be able to say, and putting them in concert and in conversation as the culmination of the entire biblical story in a lot of ways. Yeah, I think that's an, a, an awesome picture. I mean, I, I think to maybe to conclude this, this, this discussion about this question, I think a wonderful way to think about what the book of Revelation is, is to imagine John as a pastor and a theologian who has had this uh, encounter with Christ uh, and this visionary sort of apocalyptic encounter with Christ and uh, is steeped in Hebrew scriptures and tradition and is sort of inviting us into his study, as it were, yeah. and sort of introducing us to Jesus afresh through this apocalyptic encounter and introducing us to the Hebrew scriptures that bear witness to Jesus afresh as well and combining those. I think that's a beautiful image. Hmm. No, that's good. Now, the next question we received uh, has a lot of crossover with just how the book was written. You know, you've referred to a number of times that the book of Revelation and apocalyptic literature in general was a common, a somewhat common literature in John's day in the first century. It was a genre that were other books like First Enoch and a number of other books we've mentioned so far. It was one book in the midst of an entire genre of these kind of uh, encounters, these apocalyptic kind of heavens being opened. And so the question we uh, really got was, how, how do we make sense of Revelation in light of these other documents, as well as... We know like the book of Jude literally quotes the book of First Enoch. And so what do we make sense of the canon of scripture using these other scriptures? Do even these other texts, I guess they're not scriptures, but these other texts, these apocalyptic literature, do they have a sense of benefit from our lives? I know it's a large question, but just what, what do we make sense of Revelation in light of these other apocalyptic works? Yeah, yeah, it's a great question. And again, it, I, I had a really wonderful conversation with someone who asked it after service one time time, and we, we had a great a great chat about it. Uh, yeah, I think apocalypse, some awareness of the presence and significance of apocalyptic literature within what is called the Second Temple period, or this sort of period in between the time of the Old Testament and the New Testament. Uh, having some awareness of that literature's presence there and its significance can really help us, as we've talked about before, to understand the book of Revelation, because it doesn't just come out of nowhere. It is a a species of, you know, a certain kind of literature with a certain kind of style and function and purpose and that kind of thing. But yeah, as the question suggests, um, an awareness of that literature can also raise really interesting questions like, okay, well, if if John is sometimes alluding to or picking up on similar ideas from that literature, and if a book like Jude in the New Testament is... Um, is even explicitly quoting some of it, how do we make sense of its sort of authoritative status? I mean, the question becomes even more complicated when we recognize that the formal canonization of the Old and the New Testament took sort of centuries. It didn't just sort of happen as soon as these texts were written or as soon as they were collected. 
And so we have to acknowledge that there was a likely sense of fluidity in terms of which texts were understood as authoritative and sacred and in what ways uh, in the ancient world, even for someone like Jesus, even for someone like Paul, even for someone like John. We don't know for sure, you know, which texts... I mean, we can know by dating certain texts what what kinds of documents they might have been aware of, but we don't know for sure whether their version of the Hebrew Scriptures would have looked exactly like our version of the Old Testament, or if other texts would have informed some of their ideas and their theology as well. So I think recognizing the fluidity in the ancient context is important, uh, so that we don't just say, well, because because one Enoch isn't authoritative for us, somehow there's something wrong with Jude using it. Clearly, if he's drawing upon it, it had some kind of authoritative, sacred, even perhaps revelatory status from his kind of perspective. And it's entirely possible that for John, the author of Revelation, something similar existed. There, He may have had a larger corpus of texts that he would have understood as scriptural, as sacred, as authoritative, as informing his theological vision. The other element that's, I think, really helpful to keep in mind is not only in the ancient world is there some sort of fluidity that we need to take seriously before sort of formal canonization, but in some sense, if we think broadly about the Christian tradition even now, at this point in history, there are boundaries, but there is also a degree of fluidity, right? So, so Protestants would recognize sort of the Old and New Testament without these texts that are often referred to as the Apocrypha as being canonical. But within Roman Catholic and Orthodox traditions, the Apocrypha or different forms of it uh, would be included. Uh, and so all of, even there we need to recognize that there are faithful followers of Jesus within these various traditions or streams of this great tradition that actually have slightly different ways of framing canonical boundaries. And even up until the Reformation, these were things that were sort of being debated and, and, that, and that people had sort of strong opinions about. And even today, people still would have slightly different takes on. In fact, the book of One Enoch is so fascinating, not only because Jude quotes it, and so that's just sort of an interesting uh, uh, element of, of sort of trying to understand what it's authoritative status may or may not be, but there are actually um, branches of the Orthodox Church, the Eritrean Orthodox Church and the Ethiopian uh, Orthodox Church, I believe, regard New- one Enoch as uh, sacred scripture, as part of their New Testament. And so we have to sort of reckon with that today, that there are at least some communities of Jesus followers that would place a text like that alongside some of these others that, that, that you and I would recognize as authoritative and revelatory, and they see sort of God doing something in and through those, or, or their, their faith being potentially sort of meaningful. Like edified, there's, there's some piece of value yeah. there, yeah. Yeah, exactly. And so I think we need to sort of recognize that. Uh, and so I suppose, I mean, me just sort of going on and on about recognizing that even if there are boundaries, there's also fluidity, maybe isn't the most, you know, the best answer to this question in a sense of, you know, someone who's wondering, well, what do I do with First Enoch? Do I believe what it says or do I throw it out? You know, and I, I think probably just, I, I don't know if I have sort of a great answer that just tells people exactly what they should do with a text like that. But I, I think that at the very least we should, uh, one, recognize that it seems to have shaped many early Christian communities yeah. uh, and their understanding of things. It certainly bears, a, a text like that and other apocalyptic texts from the same time period certainly can help us to understand theological developments within Judaism as well as theological frameworks that set a sort of found, a foundation or a sort of frame for the New Testament. Um, and we should understand that there have been and continue to be um, communities of followers of Jesus that recognize in these texts something like what we recognize in various other parts of Scripture, that God is somehow revealing Himself or that it somehow bears witness to who God is and what God is up to in the world, and that, as you put it, that that these texts might meaningfully inform and edify our faith. And so mm. I think at least sort of wrestling with those complexities is, is helpful. Yeah. No, that makes a lot of sense. So our, 
our last question. We'll, we'll land the plane with this. We are 17 sermons in the Revelation series, probably 17 hours of teaching. The sermons were a bit long for all of us. Then there was, this is our 14th episode of midweek that we've explored about 45 minutes an hour each on Revelation. So we are a bit, I mean, 30 plus hours into conversation that people have listened to around this. And so we will be landing the plane now and moving on to a new series. Yet, what would be if someone came to you and said, you know, I really want to study more. Like, I'm not tired of this yet. I want to be able to study more and dive in. What would be some resources that you would rec- recommend for further reflection on the book of Revelation or eschatology in general? Sure. Yeah. Uh, there, are, there are a number of great ones. And some of them, uh, you, you'll, uh, I'll pose the same question to you in a moment, and you'll, you'll mention some of them. And, and some of these have been signaled a number of times yeah. through the sermon series, through being quoted or that kind of thing. Uh, some of the ones that I've found especially helpful, there's one by a, a fellow named David Mathewson called A Companion to the Book of Revelation. It's quite new. I think it was published in 2020. Uh, and he's just, it, it's a classic example of probably my, you know, my favorite kinds of books, which is where a, a, a high-level scholar who has great expertise in a certain area can somehow uh, produce something that is... Uh, concise and manageable and clear, and it just takes a lot of co- it, it takes subject matter that can feel very complex and sort of hefty, and just makes it feel sort of manageable, comprehensible, that kind of thing. So I, I would suggest his little book, a companion to the Book of Revelation, as just a, a really helpful guide through through the the major themes and the major sort of uh, and sort of the basic structure of the book. Uh, there's a book called Reading Revelation in Context that I have found really, really helpful. It's part of a series of books that these three uh, authors have done uh, where they gather together a whole bunch of different scholars who write on um, a portion of the biblical text in conversation with some other document from the ancient world from around the same time. And so it's a, it's an excellent book for a couple of reasons. One, because it situates, as we were just talking about in response yeah. to the last question, it helps us to really ground and situate the book of Revelation in its own context. And it shows, oh, it's actually playing, like it's actually building on or exploring very similar themes as this other text yeah. from, from that same time period. And it sort of compares so it like a time contrast. Stamp. It says like, oh totally. yeah, this is, this, this is the work that took place in history during this period. And this is the influence. Totally. Yeah. It's also also helpful. It's also a great one because each little chapter, they're, they're all written by different uh, scholars, and each little chapter is only some three, four, five pages. So you can read it quite quickly and just be exposed to sort of some of these themes in the book of Revelation, but also how they, how they relate to certain other themes in, in similar kinds of texts. The third one I would suggest actually isn't focused primarily on the book of Revelation and doesn't even have a ton of Revelation uh, material in it, but it's more on um, biblical eschatology as a whole. It's called A New Heaven and a New Earth, Reclaiming Biblical Eschatology by a fellow named J. Richard Middleton. And it's probably what I, I have never used it as a textbook in a class yet, but I would really like to one day. Well, you're assigned to the textbook of our church right now, <laughs> well, so you know you this go. is on the syllabus for uh, Mill Creek Four Square Church. Yeah, <laughs> it's it's a really really helpful sort of uh, walk through the entire biblical narrative in a way that helps us understand eschatology in ways that fit with how we've tried to describe it throughout the, throughout our series as something that is where God is involved in uh, restoration and redemption, not. Not just sort of destroying everything and then pulling people out so they can kind of escape to some kind of disembodied future. Well, and that's helpful to get the broader, I think the thousand foot, like broader scope, because everything we're talking about in Revelation ties to our general view of eschatology or the end times in the New Testament, as well as just the entire biblical story as we've been tying things together. Yeah. yeah. So how about you? What uh, what kinds yeah. of resources would you suggest? Yeah, I mean, people can probably guess what I'm going to say just because I've pretty much quoted from all of these at some point throughout the series. But number one, I mean, we always talk about the Bible Project. I mean, the Bible Project does an incredible job of taking these deep theological realities and kind of boiling them down into short videos or podcasts. And so they actually have a podcast series of these, I think it's eight 
a podcast about an hour each of what how to read apocalyptic literature and i'm just one of the most helpful thing i've listened to of just how to make sense of what is an apocalypse and kind of reframing it doesn't necessarily get into as much the weeds of revelation but it just sets up the genre like how do i read this type of writing um the crazy imagery right the cosmic level proportions of things how do i read this how do i apply it i mean they have their overview of the book revelation as well in a two-part series they have a video on how to read but specifically their podcast on apocalyptic literature and it's like eight episodes Secondly, we've talked a lot about the book and we've quoted a ton from Reverse Thunder by Eugene Peterson, Pastor Eugene. And I actually read this book uh, devotionally throughout the series, just kind of slowly on my own, just to let it edify my own spirit as we were reading through the book and teaching through it. And I just let Pastor Eugene has pastored me through the book again and again. And so I, I really see that as a book. If you want to be pastor through the book devotionally and just how does this apply like the way i when i was thinking about application for sermons eugene is where i went because the way he landed the plane on how this cosmic imagery calls us to something in the here and now uh, i found the most helpful and then finally the third i would say is reading revelation responsibly another book we've used a ton of by michael gorman and his book is just helpful for just working against unhelpful or maybe unresponsible views of eschatology in the book of revelation and so his is more just working through bad perspectives on it, I feel like. And he does reframe and give his own perspective on it. But I feel like his re-putting together of ideas was really helpful in that. And so uh, plenty of resources for everyone listening. I mean, they've got about six resources. <laughs> sure. <laughs> plenty to be able to take a step forward. Um, and so as we land, let me just end with this. Uh, as we land, I mean, we've done tons of hours on this. John land the plane here with the study of revelation if you could give us one takeaway one thing that's resonated like you would want to leave people with as we close this study of revelation what would be your one thing and then you can close this episode i think maybe my one thing uh, and i yeah maybe it's not one thing maybe it's sort of a, a, a series <laughs> of comments but i'll try to make it sort of brief i think that um our theological tendencies, like the kinds of impulses we have when reading a book like this, um, will be significantly shaped by our contexts, our experiences, and, and, the, and then the assumptions that we bring to the text. And so I think so much of what we've tried to do in these podcast conversations is try to help sort of reframe some of the less helpful approaches and assumptions that we might make and try to understand the book well sort of in context on its own terms in its own frame of reference. I've just been, as we've been thinking through it, as we've been talking about it on the podcast, as we, ha as a teaching team, have sort of sought to understand how to communicate it and preach from it as faithfully and responsibly as possible, I've been struck by just how how tied these ideas are, that sort of uh, our, our frameworks aren't just accidental. You know, like if we come from, if, if we are in a context characterized by sort of a significant degree of privilege and comfort, mm -hmm. There's a tendency towards sort of detached eschatological speculation because we don't need the the book's sort of vision of justice being done or or sort of God's kingdom fully arriving. Uh, if there's a sort of pessimism about our cultural moment or our cultural space, we might be prone to either a kind of escapism or a triumphalism, right? Like this idea that well, the world's kind of going to somewhere in a handbasket anyway, so we got to get out of here, or we need to sort of rise up triumphalistically and sort of fight back against secular culture or something like yeah. that. And I think the the book doesn't invite us into any of those kinds of things. Uh, instead, what it what it does is, is, is call us to persistent endurance and faithful witness as we have place our confidence in the certainty of God's victory being uh, being won and God's purposes being accomplished in the end, but we also um, live as witnesses to and 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 witnesses to who God is and and partners with God in the meantime, even if that involves suffering, even if that involves uh, difficulty and tribulation, we we sort of look forward but also participate here and now. So I would think to me that those are that, that's sort of the one of the biggest sort of takeaways is that we need to be aware of the way that our frameworks will will sort of have implications for our understanding and we need to take seriously what the book does and doesn't sort of invite us into. Mm -hmm.
Amen. Yeah. Well, with that, we land the plane officially on our study of the book of Revelation. Now, we are not ending our midweek episodes, our midweek podcast. It's something that we're going to continue doing and lining up with our series that we're preaching through to let this be a place that we can explore. Please do let us know if you have questions. Like, we always are open if you have questions on sermons and such that we can actually dive and explore these things in episodes. But this will be close. Um, you know, we just want to thank again our team, our bevy of a team of people who make this happen because we know that we are not the only ones. I mean, we get to talk into it, but we have people like uh, Tim Muchera helping with the sound production, Dave Sproul helping with the video production and putting sound together, uh, Sherry Muchera who put together all of our outro and intro and musical prowess. I guess prowess isn't even the right word, but the musical, the, the, the orchestra that is the opening and closing of this podcast. And so, I mean, we've got a whole team of people. And so please do keep tuned in, engage us with questions as we go forward. And that's all we've got for today. Thank you for joining us. And should you want more information or to engage with us further, please go to mc4s.org for more.